I want to welcome you to the Kutztown Bethel Church of the Nazarene, and I'm going to begin a series of sermons that are going to last for somewhere between 40 and 50 weeks. I'm not quite sure how long it's going to last. It'll be well into next year. This series of sermons is going to become entitled, or is entitled, Becoming a Red Letter Church. Becoming a Red Letter Church. Let me ask you a question. How many of you have a red letter Bible? Would you raise your hand? Okay, a few of you. Yeah. The first service I was in this morning, it was like almost like zero. People had red letter Bibles. So I took a moment to explain what a red letter Bible is. A red letter Bible is a Bible that has been published that the words of Jesus that have been recorded in Scripture... Now, not all of Jesus' words were recorded in Scripture, nor were all his miracles and teachings recorded in Scripture. But what we do have here that are in Jesus' words are printed in red, and that's what we mean by a red letter edition. Um, I actually gave out a copy of a red letter edition um, at the 10 o'clock service in Mukunji because... Um, you know, uh, I just think it would be cool if everybody had one. So next week I'll bring some of those with me and I'll be sure to, uh, uh, to pass those out. Um, I, it's, it's an amazing thing. I'm, I have a really good memory, except that it's real, real short. Somebody help me with the name of the lady. She's a member of our church. I visit her at least once a month, sometimes twice a month. She was the Librarian at Kutztown University. Why am I blanking on her name? Margaret. Margaret. Thank you. Margaret just Peters. Margaret Peters. That just went. It was gone. Margaret Peters. Now she was, like I said, the the librarian at Kutztown University for years. And her uh, house is absolutely filled with books. I mean, filled mm -hmm. with books. Because when her sister, who was a college professor, passed away, gave her all her books. So it's actually two libraries <laughs> under one roof. Well, the first time I visited her in her home, and at that time she was still attending here, um, she said to me, Bud, I've got all these books. I'd like to give some of them to you. And I went, okay. Because I think most of you already know by now that I really love books. Um, and I try to read a book a week, and, and just as a discipline. So uh, I said, that, that would be wonderful. She said, you can just go to the library and take what you want. I, okay. So it's been really cool. So I guess about a month ago, I was telling her about this series that I'm going to be preaching at Mukunji and that I'm going to be preaching here. I was telling her about that. And so I just said to her, I said, do you have any red letter Bibles? Oh, yes, I'm sure there's a few of them down there. Um, she said, you can go help yourself. You can go get as many of those Bibles as you want. I go, oh, that'd be nice. I can give a few of those away. Well, I came out of her house with one entire big box full of red letter Bibles. And I'm talking about some really beautiful Bibles. I'm talking about Bibles that are leather like this, and they're just have all kinds of special commentaries in them and stuff like that. I mean, these are really, really nice. So I'm going to be giving away a red letter Bible um, at Makunji, one per week, and then when I'm here, uh, for those of you who don't have a red letter Bible, I'll be giving you one so that, excuse me, so that um, hopefully you have a red letter Bible now so that when I'm preaching, you can go and look at the red letters yourself. You can see for yourself. Now, Sally told me there is an app. There's an app for everything, but Sally said there is a red letter app too. So I want to encourage you to use that, but there's something about just the physicality of having a Bible. I don't know why. I mean, I appreciate having an app, but I just love holding a physical Bible in my hands. And the old time Methodists, of which we are related as Nazarenes, the old time Methodists, especially in Britain, um, they would go to church, they would walk to church, many of them, and they would carry two things with them. They would carry their Bible and their hymn book. And uh, 
So that way, and here's the thing about this becoming a red letter church. That way, they were actually immersing themselves in the scripture all week long. Now, here in North America, we've gotten into a bit of a habit with the way we do church. A preacher such myself will stand up and announce the text and read it, and then I'll preach a sermon, and everybody will go, oh, that's nice. That's good. Thank you, Pastor Bud. And then you go home the next day and you can't, what? Okay, what was the passage? What was that sermon anyway? You know? And so I'm not trying to be hard on you because <laughs> oftentimes on Monday morning I'll go, hey, what did I preach yesterday anyway? So this is a really kind of inter um, interesting exercise that I'm inviting you all into. So give me a few moments just to kind of talk with you a little bit about this. And today we want to invite you to join the whole church. And back at Makanji, that includes the children. They're going to be joining our Red Letter Challenge too. Um, in a 40 week, it's going to be at least 40, uh, maybe 50. Um, 40 week discipleship challenge, becoming a Red Letter Church. And so for the next several weeks, beginning next Sunday, September the 3rd, Okay, it begins next Sunday is when the actual challenge begins. This is kind of an introduction. What I'm doing, the old timers used to call priming the pump. You know what I mean by that? We're priming the pump here today. Uh, we'll carefully explore the words of Jesus and we're going to explore them together. And here's the big idea. We will take the words of Jesus, the words written in red, and the goal of this whole challenge is to put them in practice. To actually begin to put them in practice. And when we do that, we will become a red letter church. So we're going to begin with this passage. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 7. Verses 24 through 27. Which really kind of introduces the whole challenge. And talks about the importance of praxis. Putting this into practice. Listen to this. Whoever hears these sayings of mine, this is uh, Matthew 7, 24. Whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house upon the rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. Now, Pastor Bud, I have a question about that passage of Scripture. You mean bad things happen to good people? You mean the rains fall, and the floods come, and the wind blows in a person's life? I thought that only happened to sinners. <laughs> uh, not according to Jesus. Listen to this. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand and the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it fell and great was its fall. Just repeat this one word after me. Thud. Great was its fall. How about kaboom? Okay. I like giving sound effects to my servants. I think you can see the point I'm trying to make here today. You see, the rain falls on the just and the unjust as well. But the difference is someone who is grounded in the word and is actually doing these things, they have a solid foundation upon which to live through the difficulties of life. That's some good preaching. I would expect at least one amen. amen. That was really good preaching and an important message to remember. This is not magic. I'm not talking about something magic here. I'm talking about a discipline that you purposefully build into your life, which is the, 
the, the discipline of hearing the word of God, studying the word of God, but more importantly, applying the word of God to your life. I heard a preacher say just recently, and at first I thought to myself, okay, that's rather bold. But the more I thought about it, the more I agreed with it. The church doesn't need another Bible study. We've had enough Bible studies. What we need is to begin to actually do what Jesus said we're supposed to do. And that's going to bring revival. Bible studies probably won't, build, won't bring revival. But making a commitment to obey and follow Jesus, that will bring a revival to your life. Now, we're not going to eliminate Bible studies because I think it is cool studying the Bible, especially looking at the background and understanding the setting and all of that. It's good. And there's some good things. And they're an encouragement to us. But I'm just wondering what would happen to this little church if we began to actually apply these principles to our lives and live a life like this. Well, first of all, you start living a life like this and you're going to stick out like a sore thumb everywhere you go. It's going, we, we're, we differ. We differ people. I mean, we're going to talk differently. We're going to have a different expression on our face most of the time as best we can. You know, there are certain words we're going to use and certain words we're not going to use. It's going to make a difference in our behaviors, in our practices. And that's what I want to get at. So we're going to drill down really hard on that. Jesus also said in Luke eleven twenty eight, 28, Blessed are those who hear the word of God and obey it. And obey it. The Apostle James said, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. So in other words, if you're listening and, on, and only listening and not doing what it says, that is a form of deception. Now that's a strong word. Mm. But if you think just hearing the word of God is going to make some kind of difference, it's a great start. But if you think that's going to change you, if you think that's going to change your world, you are being deceived. It's doing it. And I'm, I'm going to say, man, there's some really hard sayings of Jesus in here <laughs> that are difficult. I'm not going to say this for one moment. And I'll tell you something else I'm not going to do either. I'll be frank and you be earnest, okay? I'm not going to tell you that I'm arrived. Uh, th there are some things that Jesus said that I just kind of go, well, okay, maybe, maybe, uh, hopefully that doesn't apply to me. And it does. So I'm with you. We're in this thing together. We can all uh, be lifted to another level of obedience, can't we? All of us. So that's where, the, where we're going with this. So let me tell you about what we're doing at Makunji. And there's some of that that we can do here. First of all, every Sunday, and at Makanji, there's four of us that preach. I, I do most of the preaching, but Paula and Sharon and Gary also preach from time to time. We're all committed to this. Um, every Sunday, we're going to preach from a passage of Scripture from one of the four Gospels. And the thing that these passages have in common, they're all written in red. Okay? And by the way, when the children of Makanji go to children's church, they're, they're a blessing. They're, they're talking about becoming red letter children. We want to be red letter kids, which I'm really excited about that. And they are too. Then on Wednesday night at Makanji, um, I'm going to be teaching a small group on how to apply it to your life. Very, very practical. I'm not interested in theory. <laughs> We're going to get into practice. Talk about the difference that can make. Then the following Sunday morning, at Makunji, there's a 9 o'clock Sunday school class that will look back on the previous Sunday, and that will be what they're going to be discussing. So six or seven, six days later, they're going to be looking 
at, or seven days later, they're going to be looking at that passage again and drilling down on it. So you've got preaching and you've got small groups, right? And by the way, does that have a ring of familiarity at all? Mm -hmm. It's exactly what John Wesley did. It is precisely what Wesley did. Now, there's another piece to it, too. Thirdly, we're going to, let's say that I just preached the sermon today. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to post some video devotionals. Now, they're on Facebook, and I know that not all of you are on Facebook. So we're going to try to get those to you some kind of way. I'm going to be working with Sean on that. Maybe we can get them somehow on our, uh, our website or something. I don't know. But if you're on Facebook, they're going to be on there. Uh, three or four or five times a week, I'm going to do a devotional. So here's the goal. Every day, for one week, we are drilling down on one passage of Scripture. I want to word it this way. We are going to put ourselves under the authority of Jesus' words for one week. It'll be in the sermon, it'll be in small groups, and it'll be in our devotional times. Now look, I don't want you to quit. If you have a meaningful devotional life, I don't want you to quit it. Uh, but what I'm saying is, if, if you don't have access to the videos, then you can actually Google it. You can Google that passage, and there are video resources there for you, if you wish. Any way you want to slice it, I'm interested in you... For instance, check this out. If you have a red letter Bible, you not only bring it to church, but you put it on your nightstand, and the last thing you do before you go to bed is that you, you, you think about that passage again. What did Jesus mean? How, how does it relate to me? What can I do to be a more effective red letter Christian? So those are some things that we're going to be doing in this red letter project. Now, I believe I got those all those scriptures to... To you. Did I did not correct? No, not yet. Well, I'll give them to you before you leave. I got them right here. So I apologize for not getting those to you. So in other words, he's going to have an opportunity to do that teaching too in Sunday school, which will be cool. <laughs> now, one more part of the Red Letter Project that I want to talk to you about. This is something that's going to be occurring from the McCungie Church. But you know, this is our sister congregation, right? We're, we're sister churches, Mukunji and and, and uh, Kutztown. This is, we're calling it the Allentown Project. We have purchased a bus, but we're going to use it a little bit differently. Instead of the wheels on the bus go around and around, and we pick up a bunch of people and bring them to the Mukunji campus. We're going to do the exact opposite. We're going to clear out all the seats. We're going to turn that bus into a chapel and we're going into inner city Allentown. And there, our first ministry project is to minister to the homeless population of Allentown. Uh, obviously, we're gonna help them with some food and some clothing and some, you know, some other things. But the point I'm trying to make to you is this. We're also gonna be doing a sermon there. We're gonna be preaching and developing a congregation among the homeless. They said it can't be a congregation. They don't have a building. So let me get this straight. We need a building to form a congregation. What happened in the first three centuries of the history of the church? They had no buildings. They met in one another's homes. They met in third places. They met in public places. There was a time when they were being persecuted, when they met in secret. They met in the catacombs of Rome for crying out loud. They met in a variety of places. We don't need a building in order to be a church. <laughs> this has become a part of our language. Are you going to church? Yes, I'm going to church. Where do you go to church? I go to church at 125 Coffee Lane, Goodstown. Oh, okay. That's one way of understanding it. Here's another way of looking at it. You're not going to church. You are the church. And that is a huge difference, right? A huge difference. So maybe when we get to the end of uh, this red letter challenge, you will have heard the voice of the Spirit. And now you are ready to commit yourself to be the church outside these four walls. 
What's that like, Andrew? Pretty cool? Being the church outside these four walls? Oh, yeah. Really cool. And all of us, and that's the one thing I'm going to be talking about this Red Letter, red letter Challenge. Look, being a minister of the gospel, you don't even have to be a clergy person to do that. You can be a lay pastor and go wherever you want and be a pastor. Under the direction of the church, obviously, for accountability purposes. Pretty cool, huh? Now, I'm not saying we should do this, but I know a guy that the Lord laid it upon his heart and he came to me, this is years ago, Pastor Bud, I really feel like I need to start a church in, in, in a bar. And I go, wow, that's, that's really cool. Tell me a little bit about that. You mean like during the hours when the bar is not open? Oh, no. He said, no, I'm going to go get a seltzer water and go sit at the bar and start a church. So I'm a little bit nervous, man. I'm going, oh, man, we Nazarenes, we're teetotalers, man. We stay away from the hippie lettuce and the alcohol and all that stuff, man. <laughs> You know, we stay away from that. <coughs> but he was so passionate about this because he's a recovering alcoholic. And I said, you've got to be really careful going into a bar. You're a recovering alcoholic. You've got to be really careful. So you've got, look, we need some training and I need to spend some time with you. And I need to have, as your pastor, I need to have a deep, deep assurance that we're not putting you in a dangerous position. And he prayed about it. He started a celebrate recovery program in the church. He did some other things. And so he just went to, one day he came to me and he said, but, Pastor Buddy said, the Lord will not let me go on this. I really need to do this. And I said, well, I need you to check in with me when you go. I need to check in with me when you get home. Because I want to hear what you sound like. Because I love you, man. I, I don't want you to get yourself jammed up again. And you don't want to go back to the old life, do you? No. So sure enough, he, he tried it for a while. And by his own admission, he came back to me and he said, I, it's not good for me to be in a war. I said, okay. The reason why I told you this story is that wherever the Lord leads you, it's always good to have some direction from somebody who loves you, somebody who can... You know, that, you know, that cares about you and is willing to say, tell you yes and willing to tell you no. But the point I'm trying to make is you can take the gospel anywhere, kids. Our homes. Here's something we need to pray about. I'm going to go ahead and share this with you. There's a house literally right next to ours up here. And we've reached out to the kids and. We've, we've had a talk to the, uh, with the kids about leaving their bikes in my, in, their, in my driveway and some other things. Mm -hmm. We've got a great relationship with these kids. They love us. They come over and talk to us all the time. And I give them a candy bar so they really love us. <laughs> <laughs> what we just learned is that she is pregnant with her 10th, no, her 8th child. 10 kids plus 2 adults? Or is it 10 total? No, 10 kids. 10 kids? <laughs> She's pregnant with her 10th child, which means there's 12 of them in that house. Check it out. Let's just go ahead and start a church in their house, guys, because they're open. It's just that coming here, we have no programs for children. And he is Spanish only. The rest of them are bilingual. And do really well with English, but 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 he is Spanish only. So let's be much in prayer that the Lord lays it upon somebody's heart to start a church in somebody's home and who has a little bit of a working knowledge of Spanish. You say, well, Pastor Bud, that's impossible. Is it? Nothing impossible. Is it really? Nothing impossible. It just depends on how hard we pray, kids. Because prayer opens doors. And I'm just hoping that one day somebody's going to walk through these doors or I'm going to hear of somebody and I contact them. And they're going to go, yeah, man, I'm, I'm bilingual, baby. Man. You want to start a church? So anyway, I'm excited. Great days ahead for our church. 
And here's how I want to close this service like I did the other. One question. Are you in? Are you in to the challenge? Putting yourself under the authority of God's word for a week and see what happens? I hope so. Let's uh, sing together our closing song.